Welcome to Perennia's fourth webinar of the Take Your Product to Market series provided by the Agri-Food Funding Program. Today, we will be learning about packaging for your brand, developing your on-shelf salesperson. My name is Emily Page, and I'm a food scientist with Perennia Food and Agriculture. We are Nova Scotia's only development agency with a focus on agriculture and seafood. We offer services in food safety, agriculture extension, mobile wine bottling, and analytical testing of cannabis, foods, and beverages. Here at the Perennia Food and Beverage Innovation Center, we work with clients on product development, process improvement, nutritional labeling, and shelf life determination. I would firstly like to introduce our guest presenter today, Daryl Monroe of Balance Creative. Daryl and the Balance Creative team work with companies to develop branding strategies. They have worked with many food companies in Atlantic Canada, creating successful brands and improving their bottom line. Daryl is also currently a board member and part of the senior executive team of the Atlantic Food and Beverage Processors Association. Today's webinar is the beginning of a two-part series to help you understand what your brand's promise, voice, and unique selling proposition are. Daryl will also share how your company and products can have better brand recognition. Lastly, just some housekeeping notes for using Zoom webinars. If you have a question during the session, please use the Q&A button, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom window, as guests will not have microphone access today. I will be monitoring the questions throughout the webinar for Daryl, and we can answer them at any time throughout the presentation. So please submit your questions as we go, and we will answer them. There will be some final time at the end for Q&A at the end of the session as well. This webinar, along with the entire Take Your Product to Market series, are being recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, so you can replay it later or share it with your friends and colleagues who couldn't join us today. And with that, I will pass it off to Daryl to begin the webinar. Ooh, gee, that's quite an intro. Thank you, Emily. And it's nice to be here. Um, okay, so um, like Emily had mentioned in the preamble, um, this is kind of an organic uh, talk. I would encourage any of you who have any questions as we go through this um, to text or I guess, you know, in the chat room, you can actually send them in. So we'll try and do our best to answer that. So um, again, I don't know how to follow that. That's, that's quite an intro. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll begin here. So what we're going to walk through today um, in about half an hour may take a little bit longer. We've, we've allocated some time for questions at the end. Um, this, in this session, we're going to cover, what is a brand? What's your brand promise? What's your brand voice? How can you can get better recognition for your brand or your product and your company? What's your USP, meaning unique selling proposition? What meaning that what is different about your product or um, what you're trying to sell that's different from everybody else's? We'll also look at some examples of value-added products, and these are just random examples that I've kind of cobbled together for this presentation. They're not, uh, they're not examples of anything that we've personally done, but they're more just things that I thought were good illustrative points that bring that hammer home some of the things that we're going to talk about. We'll touch briefly on doing competitive research and understanding and developing your own self salesperson. So. This is really the, the crux of it is the, the salesperson thing. So we'll get into this here in a minute. We'll also cover a few things like, you know, good versus bad packaging. We've got some examples, more good than bad. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the psychology of color, a little bit about typography. And at the end of it, we've got a little bit, a couple of slides on photography. So we'll just dive right in. Um, so some quick industry stats to sort of set the, set the, the tone for kind of what Canadian retail grocery uh, landscape kind of looks like right now. So a typical Canadian grocery store has an average of about 35,000 items in it. So that means that your product is, is in there with, you know, 3,000 or 30, yeah, 30,000, <laughs> you're one of 35,000. The average, um, average retail grocery basket is between 60 and a dollar, 60 and a hundred dollars. Uh, for Canadian hustle. So that would be everything from two to four people. So that's a, that's a, a sort of a broad number. $125,000 is an average typical listing fee for a product with a Canadian retailer. For, that's for a national risk listing for one SKU. 
Now those are negotiable. I don't know how many of you have products listed with Loblaws or Sobeys or Walmart, but uh, a lot of times those are fluid and they can be negotiated depending on what your relationship is with the buyer. So for example, if you wanted to be in just Ontario, you know, they may be, the price may be one third of that. Or if you just wanted to be in Atlantic Canada, it might be one tenth. These are rough numbers. They're not, they're not chipped in stone, but I just wanted to illustrate the point that to get your product listed with these major retailers is very expensive. Um, interesting fact here is that a decade ago, there's no such thing as a gluten-free product on the, on the market. So that's, interesting in, in and I guess what I'm trying to illustrate there is the trends trends that happen in packaging and trends that happen in food um, so the average Canadian co consumer visit is about 20 to 30 minutes in a grocery store so you know people are motoring through the store a lot of them already know what they're going to be buying when they're in the store and they don't really have a lot of time I mean we're all time starved and we have uh, Convenience and um, uh, speed of getting in and out is, 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 is paramount. This was an interesting one. So almost 50% of Canadian respondents said that they, they shop regularly at Walmart for food and beverage products. So that tells you that um, you know, half, the, half the population of Canada is now shopping, not just at Loblaws and uh, Sobeys, but, uh, but Walmart is a huge player in this space. Um, so your packaging, which is what we're here to talk about today, impacts Canadian consumers, their buying decisions at the point of purchase by communicating your point, your key differentiators. So your USP, what makes you different than your competitors, um, separating it from the crowd of, again, from what your, what your competitive set is doing. You also need to, um, convey value. So that that's a quotient of price, quality, and trust. And we'll get into that as we get into the presentation a little bit more. Um, also positioning in the product, you know, is it vegan? Is it gluten-free? Is it, uh, you know, certified by, you know, some third party that may give you validation? Um, so what's a brand? Um, a brand is sort of the, you know, I'm a brand, Emily, you're a brand, like, you know, from the clothes that you wear, from the hairstyle, from the car, everything that you, everything that you do is all part of your personal brand, right? So that's, that's your package. That's how you present yourself to the world. So we all have our own brand and we all have our own unique um, attributes about it. So, um, but a lot of people think that a brand is a logo. It's more than your logo. It's about the voice that you use to communicate about your products. It's the packaging that you use to, to on the shelf. It's the language that you use to promote your products. It's how, you know, are you active on social media? Are you on television? Like, how do you, like, how do you promote it? Um, so this is the technical definition, or this is from Wikipedia. A brand is a name, term, design, symbol, or any feature that identifies one seller's good or service as it's distinct from those of another sellers. Brands are used in business, marketing, and advertising for recognition, and importantly, to create and store value for the ob object identified. This is, I think, a good definition. However, in my world, and in doing this for the past 20 some years in this space, um, I have a different definition, and it's just two words. In my opinion, a brand is a promise. It's a promise on every level that if you, if you say that you're going to deliver something, um, then your product or your packaging better deliver on what that is. So again, we'll get into that a little bit more. So um, I wanted to, I'm just gonna run you quickly through here some, some examples of what I mean by that. So there's a brand. So, um, Everybody knows what that brand is from when you're two years old until you're 92 years old. You know what that is. You see the kids going by every day, you know, on the, on the way to the, uh, to, um, to soccer practice. They all know what this is. So the brand is McDonald's and the promise from McDonald's is consistent global food and service quality. That's, that, that, that's taken right from their website. So um, the next one, 
Apple. You know what the promise is? Innovation. So Steve Jobs started uh, in, a, in, a, in a garage um, in Southern California, and it's grown to be one of the most successful and most valuable companies in the world. Their 1997 slogan was, think different. And I mean, I'm sure most of you folks out there have some sort of a, you know, some, some Apple device in your house. I was thinking about this on the drive up here today, and I mean, up until Apple introduced the iPhone um, and some of their, uh, their products, all of the, if you think about the cords that you plug your phone into to charge them, everything was black, okay? So Apple zigged when everybody else zagged. So if you think about the cord and all of the, the, the accompaniments for an, an iPhone or an Apple product, it's always white. So they were trying to stand out from the crowd. They were trying to be different from everybody else. Um, and their motto is to develop products and cons that consumers don't even know that they want or need yet. IKEA, you know that's the brand. The promise is to provide well-designed quality products at an affordable price. Again, this is taken directly from their website. What's this one? Fun, that's, <laughs> that's the brand promise. Simple, to the point, and uh, who couldn't be smiling at that? Okay, Nike, a promise to, ins a pr to bring in inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. All right, what's the brand? Well, everybody knows what the brand is, but the promise? The promise is the four words that are on that hat, is to make America great again. So the brand is obviously Trump, and the, the promise is to make America great again. So we'll leave it at that, and we'll just we'll just move on from that. Um, so your product. So if you're producing products, and I assumed that most of the folks who are listening in on this are in, you know, because of what Perennia is about, is promoting and helping to grow the agricultural and uh, and seafood sector here in, in Nova Scotia. So I made a couple of assumptions, and I'm going to base it on agriculture. So. If you're, if you're producing products in the agricultural sector, you've been planning, preparing, planting, nurturing, fertilizing, pruning, thinning, harvesting, storing, distributing, with dreams of getting your product listed for months and months and months, right? Doesn't all that sweat, hard work, early morning, late evenings, weather issues, labor challenges to get your crop ready to sell deserve the best salesperson that it could possibly get? Of course it does. This is what I'm talking about with your on-shelf salesperson. So your on-shelf shelf salesperson is your suit of clothes or your the reflection of the brand that you're trying to, to promote with your, with your consumers. So um, um, yeah, you've spent too much time, you know, not, not to invest in your packaging. A lot of people, um, and we work with a lot of printers here in Nova Scotia that, that we have a good relationship with. But I think, you know, if you're gonna, if you're going into the world of 35,000 other products that are on in the Canadian retail grocery store, um, you need to have the best salesperson that you can have. So I'm gonna take you through some examples here of, of what I'm talking about. So your packaging is key. And what you need to do is you need to stand out from the crowd. So yeah, Mr. Turnip. So Emily, let's just use a hypothetical. Say you own a turnip farm, okay? So let's your um, you you grow these beautiful turnips. Look at them. They that this has a beautiful two-tone skin. It's nice and firm. The size looks just right for that roast beef dinner for four for tomorrow night's dinner. It already has a great looking package. It's perfect, right? Like, what do you need packaging for? Well, hang on a minute. This purple and gold little gem is just the same as all the other bins of turnips that are in the store. There's nothing special about it. It's commodity, cheap and easy, right? Well, so let's start there with an obvious opportunity to create a well-dressed standout salesperson for Mr. Turnip. And we'll do that by heading over to a couple aisles in the product section and we'll go over and look at, um, and we'll go over and look at the oranges, okay? Look at that, beautiful. It's got a nice little leaf on it, beautiful looking thing. So, but when I do this to it, what happens? You just added value and credibility to your product. 
consumers have a preconceived notion about this tiny little sticker and this brand. This is an example of a good salesperson at work. He or she stands out from the crowd. It's a little different. It has, it, people understand when they see the Sunkiss name that it's going to be of a certain quality level. So I'm gonna walk over to the other section and have a look over there. Bananas, simple, right? But when you do that to it, you just, just added value to it. People know and they trust the Chiquita name to know that it's good quality. They know that they know that they're going to get. You know, and it's not even that the, the, that that banana is better than Banana X. It's just that that banana has a brand on it that you know and that you trust, and that you will probably just. It's a subconscious thing. You may see that that sticker, and you just automatically put it in your cart because you know the brand. Now, here's an example of taking that to the next level. So. What you see here is you've got the, the brand, it's a Turbana. It's, um, it shows where it's grown, the country of origin is on there. You've got the UPC code, but you've also got a QR code. So the QR code is at the bottom. And what it does is it, it, it basically, if you have the app on your phone, you can actually link and you can actually go to the website. So you can tell consumers about, about your story, tell them about your other products that you may have, and consumers want to know where their food comes from and they, it makes them feel good about buying your product from, you know, for their family. It gives you an opportunity to talk about things like nutritional information, harvesting process, are you organic, do you have any other certification. This all leads to your product offering and could result in positioning your product with retailers and consumers as a premium offering. In short, you're telling your story. That's your promise. Right on that note, Daryl, we just had a, uh, a sent in question and it's how many people are actually using QR codes? I don't have a statistic, I don't have numbers on that, but uh, you know, they're very easy to generate. We've done them for some of our clients uh, on some of their packaging and it, it's very just easy to set up through your website, if you have a website that you can, um, that, and you can go to a specific, you can set the QR code up so that it'll actually go to a specific page on your site so if you were talking about sustainability or you were talking about other products that you had, um, there's a, it's, it's very easy and very economical to actually develop, to have a QR code developed. You can actually do it yourself, basically. Okay. And are you, do you know how, um, how it works with the consumers? Like how many people are actually using them? I don't. I yeah. think, I think, again, it, it's a crapshoot. All of this, all of what we're talking about today is, you know, you're putting it out there. You're, you're, you've got your best suit of, suit of clothes on for your product. All you can do is you can hope that it's like fishing. You know, you throw your line in the water and you hope that someone's going to bite on it. That's, that's about as, as much as I can tell you. I don't know. I don't, I don't have the statistics on it. But if, if I had turnips and we, you know, we go back to our turnip analogy, um, I would have a QR code on my turnip with my PLU or my UPC code just so that I would have an opportunity to use very minimal real estate on the, on the, uh, on the product itself. And again, if you know, 2% of the, of the population has a QR code reader and they actually take time and they're interested, then again, you may, you may create uh, some customer loyalty with that. Um, another opportunity, and we've talked about doing this with some of our other clients is actually to create every, every, every skew in the, um, in the grocery store must have a, a barcode. So to, to scan through the, the front end systems, it's actually, you're allowed to use um, customized barcodes. So for example, you, these are just some examples that we just sort of put together, but you know, you can put it in the shape of a car, you can have it in the shape of a, a smile, as long as the, um, the um, and I, I don't wanna be quoted on this, but I would check this with your, your packaging folks to make sure that it does scan. But I've seen this used very effectively because, again, it's just another point of differentiation um, using something that you must have on all of your packaging. All right, so back to Mr. Turnip. Um, so what if we dressed him up a little bit differently? Um, I mean, the two-tone God-given packaging that he has is beautiful. But what if, what if we included the PLU sticker with the UPC and the, and the QR code to tell our better story? Um, and what I'm getting at here too is 
the opportunity, for example, if you had on your website, you could actually go um, link it to a page that would actually talk about the nutritional benefits of turnip. I did a lot of research on turnips as I was doing this presentation, and I, I didn't know that, that they're loaded with fiber, they have vitamin K, A, C, E, uh, potassium, manganese. I was like, wow, I'm going to start eating more turnips. <laughs> <laughs> more turnip for you too. Yeah. Too. Um, so that's stuff that's in the public domain. That's just, a, that's just, you know, turnips in general. They've all got this, um, they've all got these, you know, these healthy attributes about them. Um, did you know that there are different kinds of turnips out there? So you've got an amber globe turnip, an orange jelly, purple top, scarlet ball, white egg turnip. Um, like here's some examples. So they're not, it's not, not just, you know, it's not just turnips anymore. There's, there's varietals of turnips. Also, it seems, it sounds kind of funny when you just say, when you talk about turnips this way, it just seems weird. But like, if you think about apples, for example, you know, different apples, um, if you go to the grocery store, they have different purposes. So you've got Macintosh, Cortland, um, uh, there's Royal Gala, there's Granny Smith, there's, and they all have different pr taste profiles. They all have different um, usages. So some are better for pies, some are just better for eating. So why not, why not think about that with your product as well and think about ways that you can, again, educate your consumer to tell a better story because again, instead of them being in the bin with the rest of the turnips, maybe what you can do is you can have your own, you know, tell, tell a little bit different story. So again, here's more of our beautiful little turnips. So now I want to talk a little bit about value add, okay? So let's amp up the value quotient here. So what if you could add value to your turnip? So con consumers are time starved, especially millennials. They look for quick, healthy meal options that will save time and make their lives easier. I've done some sort of informal research here with, with um, with skip the dishes and with uber eats and things like that and you know consumers especially again millennials will pay they'll pay as much to have their food delivered as they will to actually buy the food itself so creating a value-added product like this turnip which um you know you know like simple simple packaging but there's a lot of things that are really checking a lot of boxes here for me first of all it's bilingual which is in Canada, by law, we have to have equal weighting of English to French text describing what the, uh, what the product is in the bag. So have a look at this. It's got, you know, you've got the bilingual thing going on. Um, you've got a window at the bottom to be able to see that the product is fresh. Um, there's a mark on there that says there's no, no preservatives. There's a note there as well that says it's delicious in soup. So it's a suggestion for consumers of what to do with the product. That's really key. And, I, and, and, you know, a lot of people, especially who, if you're the producer or the processor of this, you assume that people are going to know what to do with your product. That's not always the case. So if you can make a pointed suggestion about what to do with the product, um, it can go a long way. Now, the other thing that's on this package, which I liked is there's a recipe on the back. So I don't know what the recipe was or what it's for, but it's, it, 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 um, it shows usage and it tells you what to do with the product. The other thing, it looks like this bag is resealable. So if you wanted to, you could use, you know, part of the, the bag and put it back in the refrigerator and use, um, use the rest of it for tomorrow. Um, the other thing that, you know, the next one sort of um, talking a little bit about turnips. Um, is it a, we were at the, uh, the agricultural conference this week for the minister's agriculture conference this week. And someone who presented actually made the point about byproduct. So they were talking about um, uh, a product or uh, some sort of a, a weed or something that it wasn't a weed. I forget exactly what it was, but it was something growing between the, the rows of sweet corn to um, that they would plow under and it makes the, 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 the soil more fertile in the fall. So someone drove by, saw this green stuff grown in the, in the, in the middle of the aisles and they stopped and they asked if they could pick it. So anyway, um, what I'm getting at here is that even like, let's say you grow turnips and you've got the tops that you're going to cut off. So maybe they would be used, you know, you'd give them to 
a local dairy farmer or hog farmer to use as feed. There might be an opportunity in different markets to actually create a product where you would bag the turnip with the, the greens. So this, this is a nice example of using photography. It actually talks about sort of a regional, um, a regional product because they call it Southern Classics. So I guess people in the, south, in the southern part of the US must eat turnip greens. So um, there's nutritional information down on the bottom, at the bottom right hand corner. It talks about how many calories, talks about the, uh, some of the vitamins. It's frozen for convenience, which is also a nice, uh, a nice, a nice attribute as well. It looks like a resealable pouch. And in my opinion, this is a, this is a great salesperson. Um, so what if you grow turnips, but you also grow carrots as well? Why not put both of those products in the bag? Again, this bag is simple. It's clear. You can see through, you can see that the product is fresh. It's washed and ready to cook. Um, and it has an interesting thing here that says, you know, one of five of your servings of daily vegetables included in the bag it has nutritional information. Um, Includes the calorie count, has the country of origin, uh, the best best before date, and it has storage information on it. Again, and convenience, it's ready in 10 minutes. Consumers love it. Okay, so turnips with garlicky breadcrumbs and parmesan. What if you could actually create a meal bundle? So what I mean by that would be, you know, you get your turnips. So you actually, and we've, we've worked with some of our clients to actually create these. They're basically meal kits where you would have the, the uh, you know, the turnip, the Parmesan cheese, which could be dried, the dried breadcrumbs, and some peeled garlic. You could offer that as a meal bundle, and you can add ex incredible value to how much you could charge for this product at retail. So it's basically a recipe in a box. Um, and if you don't actually have, if you don't make Parmesan cheese, for example, there's all kinds of opportunities that other companies are out there that might be interested in partnering with you to you know, to sell their cheese with your turnip to have a value added product that, um, that would sell in the grocery store. What about the difference between turnip and rutabaga? Well, if you think about yams and sweet potatoes, or if you think about cilantro and coriander, they're basically the same thing as I understand it, but you know, maybe you think you've been growing turnips all this time and you're actually growing rutabagas. I don't know that I've gone to a Loblaws or Sobeys here in the last little while, where I've seen rutabagas on the shelf. So again, is it heirloom? Is it organic? Like talk about things that consumers want to know and talk about things that, uh, that again, have a point of differentiation. Um, turnip greens. Now this one I put in here because it's, uh, this is Kroger. So Kroger is a, a large grocery retailer in the US. So what this Kroger obviously doesn't have a turnip field. They don't grow their own turnips. They, uh, they buy them from, from producers who, who grow them. So look at opportunities, even if you wanted to have a relationship, if you've got a relationship with your buyer and you want to sell your products as private label, but again, turnip greens in a bag um, could be an opportunity. Um, frozen. So this is a, basically it's about the size of a piece of, uh, well, I guess it's larger than a, uh, a pound of butter, but basically it's it's the greens with the turnips. You can slice it off. You can use as much as you need of the thing. Throw it back in the freezer, and it's uh, simple. Mashed turnip. Now this would obviously take some processing. You may need to get it, um, you know, done up by somebody else. But the idea here, I love this one. You know, it's ready to eat, vegan, gluten free. The serving size is for one. It's cooked fresh on our farm. I like that line as well because it conveys small batches in farm fresh. It's organic. It has a third party endorsement from a, some sort of an association on there. It's gluten free, nutritional, frozen, and uh, as photography. Again, think about your product and do a bit of a brainstorming session with you, yourself, and your staff. And just kind of think about what it is about your product that is different than everybody else's. You need to stand out from the crowd. Here again, we go with the carrots, parsnip, and turnip. Like use blends to be able to create. Look at the, look at that. It's got the, um, it's got all the nutritional information on there. Um, the other thing I want to touch on with this one is that this mash direct. I don't know if it, if that's the brand, 
but this one and this one is it creates a family of products. Now, from my experience with working with retailers is they love to have not just one product, but they love to have a family of products that they can actually sell. So if you have an opportunity to show multiple, multiple SKUs in the same space, that will sometimes um, be a little more, more favorable to you as a, as a, as a supplier to them because they're looking for not just one as an orphan product, they're looking for multiple products. Um, if you're looking at export, you know, like understand who, who you're selling these to, you know, the translation, and we'll get into this here in a second. Um, this is a small package of, you know, salted turnip. So again, this is, this is an Asian, as an Asian package. Um, so again, look, look for opportunities in other markets where something that you and I may not eat as, you know, regular, you know, a regular item on our, our Sunday our Sunday evening dinner plates, look for opportunities in other places in other countries. Here's another one, you know, we don't eat haggis here. I've been to Scotland and it's very popular. It's, it's something that, you know, they just, it's part of their, their culture. So you know, here's an opportunity to just, you know, can and send to, you know, other parts of the world products that, uh, that go with or that work with uh, sort of regional and sort of different geographical popular products. What about the seeds? Why not? Think about it. I mean, it's an opportunity to, for you to sell product and to be uh, just using what you've got in your, in your toolbox to be able to, to sell it to other spaces. Soap. Yeah. <laughs> turnip soap. I was kind of surprised too. I didn't, I didn't. I don't think I want to smell like turnip. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I do either, but anyway, <laughs> this is a real product. I guess it's out there somewhere. But knowing the market and understanding who you're selling this, it's made in Thailand, so I've never seen this on the shelf, but I thought it was an interesting way to uh, utilize something that, again, we have on our, with our roast beef dinner. So I'm just going to take you through a few examples of what I think are some beautiful packages here. This is a company from Italy called Insularte, and they've, th these folks have won dozens of awards. The, uh, this, the beauty of this packaging is is uh, is apparent it's simple it's obviously one language it's um it's not it wouldn't obviously comply with what we've got to do here in canada with this but i just thought you know they've got a beautiful line of, of products here that use the photography beautiful white clean has a, has a window at the bottom they also offer other products so there's some over on the left hand side here you can see there's some value added salads and if you note down at the bottom left there, you'll see that the actual the tomatoes at the bottom are actually still on the vine. So to a consumer, that connotes freshness and it connotes the fact that it's, um, you know, that we this is a premium product. You can see the olives, you can see the ingredients, you know that this is fresh. And if you look at it with all the family of other products that are in this range, they all have that beautiful white, the use of the photography, the use of the, you know, simple, and elegant typography, beautiful stuff. They also offer, um, here you see some examples of the gas flush products or modified atmosphere packaging. Um, they've got merchandise, corrugate stackers, um, and the retailers would love it because on the left-hand side there, you can stack these things, but you can still see into the product to see that it's fresh. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in session two. All right, what happens if you got lemons? or in this case, you've got ugly carrots. Um, there's an opportunity, I think, here with, um, with sort of your B-grade stuff and some of the stuff that you may be producing to actually, um, to, to actually sell these. Um, um, they may be ugly, but they could still be profitable. I mean, some of these are, um, well, I wouldn't call them grade A, but they certainly, they certainly have all the same attributes. Here's a, here's a company in in australia so it, it's a growing trend in food marketing to promote and sell products that may not look perfect but they have the same nutritional values they're grown in the same grown to their same standards and they come from the same basically the same place so, so from the same tree or plot of ground um, they're just not as pretty as their brothers and sisters um, this is also apparent with certified organic products because a lot of times with organic products you don't get the uh you know, as perfect or this, this, the skin isn't as shiny. Um, I like the branding on this Coles bag from Australia at first glance because it says 
in my first read, it says I'm perfect, when actually it says imperfect. It was what, what it's really trying to get at. Loblaws actually has um, a no-name product um, that they're calling naturally imperfect. And you can actually buy this at some of the, uh, I, I know it's available at No Frills, and I think some of the, um, some of the other banners that they, they also sell. These folks did, um, they've, again, they've had huge success with this um, in Australia, and they've created an ad campaign that, you know, a grotesque apple a day keeps the doctor away as well. Um, the ugly carrot in the soup, who cares? It doesn't really make any difference when it's all cubed up. Um, again, just beautiful photography, um, the disfigured eggplant and the hideous orange. I love, the, I love that one. It makes beautiful juice. Um, so they've all, you know, they've done, this would be um, POS in a store, talking about the imperfect pick, picks. Um, so it's reducing food waste. It help, it's helping the Australian farmers to sell and um, uh, get rid of their, you know, their products. And again, to a consumer, if you're cutting this up for soup or you're mashing it up, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, so I'm a little out of shape. Who isn't? It's just, you know, just brilliant, brilliant advertising. Um, same, same, but different for farmers in the environment. So again, there's an environmental play here. So what if you actually called your brand ugly? This one is called Ugly Potato Chips. Like that's the name of the actual brand. Are chips and potatoes with minor imperfections still taste the same? And I love that. Save a potato. Brilliant. Um, okay, so here's some examples of what I would deem as sort of bad packaging. This one is, um, uh, I think what's happened here is probably some translation has gone wrong. So this is obviously uh, an Asian packaging. It's a piece of bread is what it is, but the somehow in the translation, it's gotten lost and they call it fresh wheat gluten. The other thing that I thought was interesting about this is you need to keep it refrigerated. So again, this may be just a factor of, of translation gone wrong, but um, this would definitely not work in the gluten-free aisle. I love this one too. Now, I don't know whether someone on the loading dock got the bags wrong or what's going on here, but my, I don't know, does that look, do they look like bananas to you? It's not bananas, no. <laughs> no, I don't think it's bananas, but you never know. All right, now, even if you own a, a farmer's market or your um, have a roadside stand, look for opportunities to package your products with a bag. I mean, it could be as simple as that. You've got to put the, the potatoes or the carrots or the, the you know, cauliflower, whatever you're growing, apples. If you have a roadside stand, I mean, this is a pretty, this is a, you know, a two, I guess two color printed bag, but why not put a, why not put a printed, um, you know, rubber stamp on this to, so that you brand the products that are in your bag. And again, if we go back to the QR code, give them an opportunity or give consumers an opportunity to check you out and to promote your brand, to make it stand out from your, from the crowd. All right. So we're going to cover, uh, how are we doing for time? We're good. You're okay. Yep. So I wanted to touch a little bit on color and people find this stuff fascinating. I do as well. And again, we have many clients that we, you know, using color to uh, promote and to actually um, cycle, not psychologically, but just to, just to different colors do different things. And I'll just sort of walk you through here kind of what I'm talking about. So let's talk, start with gold. Okay. So gold, um, it connotes expensiveness, luxury, and quality. Now, one of the issues with gold can be, and we've, we've run into this before, is when you print gold on a traditional bag or a package, if you don't use a uh, metallic gold, and depending on what you're printing it on, it can actually turn out to be brown. So it actually doesn't bring that whole um, beautifulness that it could actually do if it was actually printed gold foil or gold ink. So just, you know, use that as a word of caution. Silver is the same way. Um, to, to print metallic silver or to use foil packaging can be very beautiful, very stunning, gives a premium look, very, you know, elegant, sophisticated, but using it in a, in a printing method that's not either metallic or, um, or, or, or with a foil, it can actually just turn out gray. So it doesn't work that well. Now black is um, black is 
always mysterious. It's got a very powerful, mysterious, elegant, classy look to it. I've seen some beautiful packaging done with black. Um, makes it, it makes it appear expensive. It can also, um, you know, can really add, you know, you think of different things like black magic, you think of, uh, oh goodness, uh, black is used, uh, President's Choice did a, a series of packaging uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it was President's Choice Black, and it was it was mostly products from other parts of the world. Price point on it was very premium, and it uh, and it sold quite well. So now white, on the other hand, is clean, simple, new beginnings. Now, if you if you take you back to the Insularity packaging that I showed you before, you know it's it's a beautiful. It lets photography stand out. It gives you an opportunity to um, create. Just a really clean, beautiful, beautiful packaging it, with a, you know, as a, again, we go back to the Apple thing with the, with the white cords and whatnot. It just, it's, it, it's just different. Um, blue, this is typically used, blue is typically used in the seafood sector. You know, a lot of, a lot of products, um, either they're in a bag or a box, they will, uh, you know, use different tones of blue. Um, it's a, it's a safe color to use with your package design because it's 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 liked by both men and women. Um, if you're looking for professionalism and seriousness, I would go with like a, a darker blue. If you want your um, if you want your product to connote more of a creativity, a little lighter, almost you, you, I would use something like a like a sky blue or something a little bit lighter. Green. Um, Green is environmental, it's good for the earth, it's always got a, a sense of freshness to it, harmony of by, mind and body, um, and it also is the color of money as well. So um, typically nowadays with, uh, with organic packaging and with, uh, um, with natural, more, more natural type products, green is very common and used a lot in different, uh, different applications. Red. Now, um, remember back to the McDonald's example. So McDonald's uses red and yellow as their primary colors for most of their advertising. Red is what we call a jump color. So red um, exudes energy, passion, excitement, strength. And it, it's, it's very, um, it draws a lot of attention to itself. If you think about a, about a stop sign, a stop sign is, you know, catches your attention. So red is something that's always um, going to stand out on a shelf because it's, it's bright and it, uh, you know, it makes you stop. Um, so I would choose darker reds for more of a luxurious feel and uh, brighter red for something that's a little lower value. I would, that's how I would sort of set that up. Orange. Orange is called a declassifying color. And uh, if you think of Home Depot, it's a, you know, very approachable. It's uh, fun, optimistic. Um, it's a, uh, it's an enthusiastic. It's get a. It's 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 just. It's very approachable, and it's it's used a lot, and can be used with complementary colors that actually make it stand out. Again, another another jump color that makes um that makes a product stand out. Um, gray. So again, back to the silver thing where you've got conservatism. It's very neutral. It's 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 reserved. It doesn't have a lot of personality to it. it. Can be used as a background, and it, we've used it very successfully with some products. But again, the use of color for your typography and the use of um, the use of some photography can actually bring this really to life. It actually can qu look quite regal. But it, again, it depends on whether you're selling shoes or whether you're selling turnips or whether you're. It depends. Um, gray turnip would probably not be a good thing. Um, brown. Strength, earthiness, maturity. It's a, it's a very popular color these days. Um, you'll see a lot of packaging now is that craft brown color. It's like it's like a, it's like a craft paper. So it's, again, you're trying to connote that whole natural thing back to nature, a little less uh, processed, a little less contrived. So uh, popular. Purple. We're coming into the Easter season. We've used this color a lot for um, for products that we've done, especially sort of in the in the candy category. Again, it, people just automatically think of regal um, royalty, 
uh, it also has that connotation of being an Easter color. Turquoise. Um, so this one is popular with a lot of spa and kind of, um, I'll call them more feminine type products where you've got a little bit more of a freshness, uh, calm. I think of a lot of spas use, um, use turquoise as sort of their key colors. So if you're pr promoting cosmetics or health products, this is probably a, a nice color to use because again, if you're trying to appeal to more of a female demographic, this might be something that you might want to look at to, uh, to promote your product. Yellow. So think about this one with no name, with, with Loblaws. Um, their, their, their boxes, bags, and all of their packaging is bright yellow. So yellow is, a, again, it's a declassifying color, and it tends to be perceived by consumers as being cheaper or less expensive, and, and so, in, so, in a lot of cases, lower quality. Depending on the use of yellow, again, it can work very, it can work really beautifully with, with some accompanying colors. But you know, if you had a yellow box, you know, you would probably be, um, you, it would probably, everyone would, kind of think that it would be a, a no name, no name package or a, um, pink. Again, with the Easter season coming into into uh, into play here, uh, pink can be actually a beautiful color for um for easter type products but it's also a product uh, or a color that's used again for you could use it for um for packaging for um more feminine type products it's uh it's uh it, again using it with the right color combination can be really beautiful so let's talk a little bit about we've like we're running out of time i guess i guess i run, over overshot the runway here with the first time so let's just talk a little bit about typefaces so typefaces are uh I've broken it into six categories here so classic serif which is sort of what you would read like you know times roman um they all have their place they all have their uh relevance and they all have their use on packaging it depends um on kind of what your what your met what your what you need to, uh, the message that you're trying to convey with your packaging or the mood that you're trying to, to uh, that you're trying to convey. So you've got classic modern, or the, sorry, the modern one. Typically when we do um, ingredient decks and whatnot, uh, according to CFIA regulations, your, your type size has to be of a certain size um, and you have to be compliant with that to get on the shelf. So typically uh, sans serif typefaces we use for ingredient decks, but the X height, not to get technical, but the X height or the height of the letters needs to be a certain size. And uh, again, conforming to that um, will get you on the shelf. If you're not compliant, you'll, you won't last on the shelf. They'll, they'll pull you off. Slab serifs are like classic serifs. They're just a little bolder. Um, scripts can be used very effectively. Again, depending on what the message and what the product is that you're trying to sell. Um, I see a lot of products out there now with, an, with handwritten, um, with handwritten looking uh, typography. And then decorative, again, my caution here would be to, to, to use decorative fonts minimally because, again, if you only have a few seconds to make an impression on a customer as they're walking by the shelf, you don't want to get too, um, too elaborate with your typography and you want it to be legible. So keep it simple. Um, I've just included a few examples of some packaging that I like. Again, just using simple simple language and simple sans serif type to, um, you know, tell you that box water is better. Again, we get back to the promise. This is the promise. The box water is better. I love this one. It's using serif typefaces. But look at the way these are merchandised. They're 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 not using the face panel of the box they're using the corner of the box so what they've done is they've wrapped the the typography around the um, the angle so you think about this merchandise on a shelf in a store this is going to stand out because it's not your typical um, it's not your typical way that you would merchandise these the other thing that if they did merchandise them um, typically or flat front the the no it actually wouldn't work i was thinking but this again just thinking different to be to, to stand out from the crowd i love this packaging too it's very christmasy has a you know nice 
light, airy, seasonal feel to it. Nice use of um, what I would call decorative or, uh, or script typefaces. And then our good old friend Cannabis has made its way into this presentation as well. Now this is not obviously Canada and this is chocolate. So what it does is it tells the story of, you know, how much, um, how much THC is in there. It tells it what kind, it's dark, it's light, it's milk. Um, and then you've got different, you know, the different, uh, different varietals, it's top, beautiful. And again, talk about brown packaging. This is using that craft paper um, packaging, printing the, uh, the leaf on it. And again, very, very striking. I love these guys. I don't even have to tell you what this is. It's the same thing. You know that that's milk in a jar. It, it does say milk in the small text there, but using the packaging medium to create a unique package that is just uh, going to stand out on the, on the shelf. If you look at the cows as well, all three of them have different faces. They all have uh, a little bit different personality. Brilliant. I love this one too. Again, using black premium. It's so using the window in the front of the box to actually illustrate what the shape of the package is. Um, again, simple, beautiful, elegant. I love this one too. Um, we are asking about, you know, packaging solving the problem. What's the promise? Well, this is the merchandise. This is actual, I believe this is real packaging. So what's wrong? Help, I have a headache. Help, I can't sleep. Help, I have an aching body. So at the bottom it says, you know, acetaminophen, ibuprofen. So it's using a little bit of comedic relief to actually position the product and to be, to, to, to solve the problem that the consumer might have. Love this one too. Makes your hob sparkle and shine. Not sure what that is, but it makes your carpet and your upholstery fresh, fresh and clean. Tell them what it, tell them what your product does. That makes it different. I love this one too. So I'm almost finished here, Emily. I'm almost done. Almost done. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this in the next session as well, about using merchandisers and positioning your products with your customers, being the retailers and making their life easier so it moves your product off the shelf. So this is a nice example of, you know, a corrugate merchandiser that has bins in it that you can actually choose, um, choose the product out of it with, again, text up above that explains, you know, what this is. Love this one with regard to the consistent green wave that goes across. So whether it's a bar, whether it's a bottle, whether it's a, a jar, whether it's a tube, or whether it's a box, it all has this consistent look and feel and color palette to the whole thing. So photography. So how many people have one of these? We all have one of these, okay? How many people have seen this? I'm sure you've seen this. This is an Instagram photo of someone who takes pictures of their lunch. So Food is actually the most photographed thing on the web, on the web today. Um, I don't know how many people you see, they're at lunch and they're taking pictures of their salad or their soup or whatever they're taking. This is not the quality of imagery that you need for your packaging. If you're gonna do this, I would caution you to hire a professional photographer. Give me a call if you want, I can help you out. But do not use um, iPhone photography to do your packaging. You want something that's going to um, be mouthwatering, something that says, I want a bite of that. And then the other thing that I've worked with over the years is many, many of North America's food, you know, best food stylists. These folks can make food look amazing. And I, again, I, I, if you're interested, I can, I can help you out with some of that kind of stuff. So beautiful photography of your product. And depending on who you're going after as your customer, um, Try and set the tone and be relevant to what your consumers are looking for. Um, again, more decadence. And then the last, the last one is just you know that combination of, um, you know, if we put all that together, you've got the logo on here. This, um, you get the color sprinkles and adds an element of fun. You get the dark premium box, um, simple sans serif typeface, professional photography. The box of four is communicated. It's got information on there about your telephone number, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. This is a good salesman, in my opinion. Okay, any questions? Oh boy, am I, did I ever run? Did I ever <laughs> a shoot little a bit, yeah. Um, there is not a question right now, but there is an FYI, and it says that the NS Farmers Market Association did a great series of photography, and it's on their Facebook page. Oh, awesome! I'll check it out. Thank you.
So if there is any questions, this would be a great time to submit them in and we will answer them in the last couple minutes here. And I apologize for taking so long. I get talking about this stuff. I, I love it and it just kind of, I find it interesting just being able to try and help you know, solve some of these issues. The turnip thing was actually really interesting for me. I learned a lot about turnip. <laughs> We're getting no question. They've all gone back to work. Oh, here we go. What is the uh, what is the typical and expected a cost um, a person should spend on packaging? Oh boy, how long is a piece of string? It depends. It depends really. Well, what your product is, um, how you want to package it. Um, I said earlier that we work with a lot of printers um, that have some design capability. Um, if you're going to develop, and this isn't, a, I'm not dissing the printers, but I think if you're developing a line of products and you want to develop your brand, then you should talk with someone like us um, to just be, to make sure that all of the, all of the, the package thing that you're doing fits with what your, with what your end goal is, whether you're, um, cause it's really difficult to, to nail that down. I mean, it depends on your quantities of how many you're, how many bags you're producing or how many boxes you're producing. We'll talk a little bit more in the next session about, um, you know, about sustainability. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the mediums that, you know, you can use. There's flexography, there's lithography, there's, um, there's all kinds of different types of printing. Um, so I don't really have an answer for the question. I just, I... Okay, we'll flip to the, uh, the last slide there with our info. Sure. Yeah, so the next session will focus on the differences that your customers and your so customers and consumers are looking for in packaging, meaning the retailers. We'll also cover more details on your USP and do a little more in-depth exploration of your packaging as your brand and your brand's best salesperson. Packaging innovation and packages and packaging trends. So that's what I look like. That's what Emily <laughs> looks like. And if you have any questions, please direct them through Emily and we'll uh, Hopefully we'll be able to solve some of these folks' problems. Yeah. Thank you, Daryl, for presenting today and teaching us all about developing a brand through packaging. If your question wasn't answered during the session, please see Daryl and I's contact information on the screen. Feel free to email us your questions using the subject line branding packaging webinar, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. This webinar was the first of a two-part series, so please join Daryl and I again on March 19th at 12 p.m., where we will dive more into packaging innovation and packaging trends. Thank all of you for joining us today. We hope to see you again throughout the Take Your Product to Market webinar series. The next webinar is next Thursday, March 12th at 10 a.m. on sustainable packaging. We are having two guest speakers from the University of Guelph and one from the Sustainable P Packaging Coalition. You can find information for this webinar along with the rest of our series on our website. Thanks and have a great day. Bye guys.